In a nation divided by red and blue, we at Core Values want to lead from the front. We want to bring both sides together and help create a unified purple nation. Hey, how's everybody doing? This is another installment of the Core Values Podcast. My name is Zach. I'm the host. And today we have part two, round two, with my really good friend, Rafael Silva. Um, We had a really good conversation before. We really got into a lot about what your mindset is and kind of some of the really difficult things that you've had to overcome to really get to who you are. But we never really got down to the, the origin of who you are and kind of really dig into what your trades and your intellect and all that stuff that we got. We just kind of skimmed it over in the first time. And I think you, you are, you, our relationship earns, you know, we need more depth, you know, out there. I get that. Yeah. We, we definitely uh, jumped through a couple of things. We were like, you're a medic, you're a diver. <laughs> no, yes, I am. Uh, but yeah, man, uh, my name's Rafael Silva. Um, I grew up all over the world. Luckily, uh, both of my parents were military. My mother was in aviation, uh, my father was a infantryman. We talked about that a little bit. Um, they met in the army. I was born in Vicenza, Italy, and raised all over the world, man. I was up yeah. through Germany. My pops went to Korea. I went to uh, freaking all over the world. I, got, I don't even know where to start. Uh, but my, my biggest, my biggest fondest memories are are all in Italy and Germany. Um, but uh, the first th- time we came stateside for for like school and stuff, I remember being in Massachusetts, and man, that was just a wake up call. And just uh, moving into middle school, Massachusetts, then we went to South Carolina, and I wow, that was that was a, that was a wake up call too. That was when I really experienced like what racism was. Like I, I was just a child child of the world at that time, you know, army brat, didn't know anything about it. Yeah, hit South Carolina for about ten months, and then we moved to Fort Myers, Florida, where I went to high school. Uh, learned how to play football, got a scholarship, uh, ended up going and play up in North Dakota State. Transferred to Erie, Pennsylvania, out in Gannon. Um, what was that? What was that like for you? So you, let's go back to you know having yeah. those yeah, yeah. that both parents that were in the military. Did you feel that you had a lot of? Um, over discipline when you were younger that really correlated with the discipline that was in the military or do you feel that you had structure that allowed you to to build in something positive in your life i think uh it was a little bit of both man i think my dad uh being a platoon no he was a squad leader he was an e6 when i came online when i remember uh it was our second time in italy and i was about five and uh like I just, he never brought that home. When he hit the door, that was gone. He was, he was, he was dad, but he was gone, right? He was in the field. He was always deployed uh, through the nine, uh, early, uh, late eighties, early nineties. He was always gone through the Middle East. Um, and like, it just showed me, like, I just kind of followed suit. He never really wanted me. He didn't wake me up and like, make your bed in the morning, you know, and, you know, your boots shined, your sneakers clean. No, nah, he let me be a kid. Uh, he never even pushed me into sports or like my, my mother uh, really never pushed me towards any certain direction. They kind of just let me be me. I think at that time they were just trying to survive. I remember there, were, I do remember like posters of people at the airport, like, Hey, you know, soldier family need help with food and stuff like that. We ate at the, we ate at the chow hall a bunch of times, a bunch of times. I'd love it. Cause you got the ice cream machine. <laughs> like, we'll get the ice cream machine. Now I think back and you just making these giant cones and all these privates just like turd. <laughs> so, so when, you, when you were going through that, was your view of the military as like something that you were like, Oh, this is a great, great people, the great organization. These things, these people are heroes or are you looking at it as like, well, this is just my everyday life. Like I'm looking at it as if I would go to school and these are just schoolmates. Yeah. They were, they were real people to me. Um, it wasn't any heroes and, that stuff gets gets interesting for me. Uh, yeah, people start throwing that one around, the heroes and, well, what, and what, American what? heroes, and like, yeah, they're they're real people. Yeah, they're they're doing their job. I yeah. I signed up to do my job when people are like, hey, thanks, thank you for your service. You're a real hero. Eh. 
I did, I did a job. Thanks. Yeah. You had <laughs> your tough. name on the list. Right, man. I just wrote it down. I, I used it to travel. I used it to travel. I used it for a paycheck. I used it for a steady backup plan, man. You know, mm. there wasn't anything emotional about me joining up. I watched my, my parents use it to travel the world. I wanted to do the same thing. And, and I did, uh, when I was done with Erie, Pennsylvania, I, I graduated with a criminal justice degree and I was like, I really don't want to be a cop. I was a bouncer, for, you know, for all the years in college. I dealt with enough cops where I was like, yeah, that's not a great time. Yeah. I want to do physical therapy, but our coaches weren't allowed to, what well, they wouldn't allow me to take it because that was all evenings and weekends. That's yeah. what football is. So I was like, ah, criminal justice, yeah. underwater basket waving, I guess, right? Let's chalk it up. And you did, you did school before or after the military? Before. I did before and after. Before uh, and after. Yeah, because I, I was, I was um, so I ended up going into the military because uh, I wanted to change it up, right? Yeah. Became a paramedic. Uh, became an EMT. I became a paramedic in 2010. 10, I got my P. Um, I don't know. I, I forget. 2010, 2013. One of them. <laughs> Both numbers are really specific in my head. I don't know why. Sorry, I've been, been blown up a few times. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but yeah, I, I did school before the Army. Mm -hmm. I you know, lived on my own, pulled out a loan. And that's why, I, uh, so I didn't have to live in the barracks or the, the, the dorms, yeah. right? So I uh, had my own apartment. I was with a, a, a chick at the time. We got our own place and uh, lived on our own, right? So me joining the Army, whew, that was a change of pace, right? I'd go for living on my own. Here's basic training. I'm living in a bay with 95 guys. I'm yeah. just like, whoa. Open yeah. pissers. And I, at the same time, that didn't mean shit for me. I was yeah. in the, part of the ND, NCAA. You're getting piss test. Yep. You know, okay. you're walking into a room with three people. And like, all right, drop it. I need to be in this cup. <laughs> Wait, like, so you played football before the military? Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I played in, played in college for the first time. Yep. That's how I got to college. It's the only way I got to college. I wasn't paying for it. Yeah. I, both my parents being military and just we, we weren't able to afford it yeah you know and hurricane charlie just come through uh fort myers and just tore havoc no money on the table for me but i got a scholarship because i was just hitting people really hard on the football yeah. field man <laughs> you know what, was that a full ride scholarship yeah i got i got a, a full ride for for north dakota state and then transferred out to gotcha. pennsylvania gotcha and the only thing um i actually i pulled a loan out for student loan it was like 20 grand just so i could pay rent and had wow. you know money for for food and stuff just as a backup plan man yeah uh my dad really beat that into me is having a plan you know yeah. putting shit together and i saw him do that i saw him do that and write down all those crazy little green notebooks that everybody in the military walks around with they were doing that in the 80s and 90s too mm -hmm. you know keeping little notebooks and making plans make a plan for your day make a plan for your year where do you want to be yep are you do you know if you're going to be able to eat next week true my fat ass wants to know that, you know, yeah. I need, I need to, I need to secure that meal. Uh, so that, that was a couple of things that I saw that were positives on the military. You know, they had a great insurance plan, a health insurance program, right? Got a great physical program, gyms, every post, Everywhere. you know, PT yep. all day. Yeah. <laughs> PXs. Yeah. Right. You know, Class six, you know, yeah. all the essentials. Everything you got you it need. all there on post, man. I was like, man, I don't I don't have to work, get yeah. to go play out in the field, come back. Everybody's taken care of. Now, what made you when, because we spoke about it before, but I just kind of want to get around it to again, but you, you went in after playing, you know, football as an offensive lineman and offensive line has a really big, you know, the, the, the purpose of the offensive line is to protect and to take care. Right on. And, you know, you were going <laughs> against like you, Based off your words, you're going against guys who are much bigger than you. Oh man, and yeah. You're the at small the time, guy. In the at the time, I mean, they were only like 30 more pounds than me at the time. But yeah, man, they were six nine, six yeah. eight. Yeah, they're big boys. Man. Big boys. Yeah, and then, and, and <laughs> so you're you're going into this as as that protector, and you're you know giving giving your all. And this is before you even. I mean, you kind of been raised in a very you know protective mentality. And being able to apply that to uh, an action, uh, it gave gave you an outlet. Yeah, it really did. Uh, and that and that is one thing. Yeah, that we talked about the last time. Uh, 
you know, it's one thing that I, I didn't enjoy growing up is seeing bullies and seeing people get picked on, getting shitted on. Yeah. And one thing I, I was able to do on the football field was get a lot of aggression out, get a lot yeah. of just testosterone that was brewing that I didn't even know. I needed an outlet. My dad told me that. He's like, I wound up in the army because I got in trouble yep. because I, I didn't have an outlet. You need to find an outlet. We need to figure something out for you. And then he's like, I'll back you up with whatever you want to do, but let's pick something cool football and i yeah it was cool as a game but i got to just hit people i got to block and everything yeah. i liked i liked blocking i liked taking care of people i like people relying on me in shitty situations right yeah loved uh having that relationship with the quarterback it was, and then to come to find out so the very similar relationship that my me as a medic i had exactly. with my infantrymen you know yeah. all my infantrymen they love doc you know and that was my shit like I, i'll be the best medic you can you know i'll come and check on you whenever you need that was my that was my thing. I loved helping people. I, I still do, uh, just different ways, you know. And now, you know, now I'm not a protector of many. I just take care of my house, you know. I take care of my little community. Well, I want to get into you know being a medic, yeah, you yeah. know, because there's so much that goes into being a medic. Oh yeah, you, know, you have to know the knowledge. You have to know the application. You have to know the problem solving. Oh yeah, so you have to predict the the past, the present, and the future. Um, so flow charts, man, flow charts, <laughs> and, and, but, it, but it's all on a timeline flow yeah. charts on a timeline. Yeah. 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 Uh, that, which is, you know, very, very difficult to learn. Like once yeah. you, you're able to think in stressful situations, then you have to problem solve under s stressful situations. And then you really have to, you know, there's, there's levels to this shit. Yeah, man. Uh, and I, I found a good segue into being a medic, you know, it was, a li it was, it was just a combination of everything. Me being, I kind of got jaded because I wasn't able to do physical therapy in college, right? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so me not wanting to be a cop and joining the army, I get to choose my job. And this, mm -hmm. and this guy was like, yeah, I got a medic with an option 40 contract, the ranger contract. And I was like, medic? Yeah, yeah, you're working with bodies and limbs and stuff. And I'm like, oh, like PT? He's like, yep, there, there are medics to do physical therapy. And I was like, got me. But I, I mean, they do. They just, I, I ended up doing it at the end of my career. Uh, but, uh, you know, the medic was the best choice for me because you, you're needed everywhere. You can volunteer for everything, anything that happens in the army and with the army outside of duty hours, you need a medic. So dude, I got to travel through Germany doing tough mutters. I got to go do a hundred, you know, a hundred mile March because they needed a medic. Well, yeah. I carry stuff, you know, like in Texas volunteering for Molotov cocktail drills. Oh, yeah. you, you need a medic to watch that. I'll go watch people get lit up. What's up? <laughs> you know, volunteer for everything. One thing I never got picked for was Antarctica, but man. But what, what but, made what made it special the, for you to really yes yeah, be the best medic you could be like what made that ah, that the be well, the, best, the best oh that's that was army. an awesome one be, be, yeah I know be all, all you can you be you can be that was in the nineties bro come on that was Polly Shore <laughs> but yeah man the, the the it was all kind of formulated in the same thing so me wanting to do physical therapy I wanted to take I was into you know caring for people playing offensive line yep. being protector right medic was the perfect spot for me uh, so. I was just like, cool, I can help people, but I can also be upfront if I need be. You know, I can get into whatever I want. Joining the army, getting into it, ended up uh, understanding what a combat medic was and understanding my my history. Uh, you know, my my father being in the army, uh, my mother being in the army, my grandparents being in the army. Um, it's just a it's just a good place for me to be a protector. I was I giving back to my past and also getting to like move in through my future right mm -hmm. kind of like uh use it for my own journey both my grandparents used it so oh excuse me both of my parents used it my grandparents used it to move forward in their life and go check shit out right one thing i got to do get to go help people all over yeah. the world right and so yeah learning you know pharma was the worst man i'm still crappy with pharma but man treating people keeping yeah. people alive plugging holes man keeping people from bleeding out just yep. plugging holes it's very simple one thing I got to I got to learn, you know, be, working on motorcycles, you know, when and, and through college and early age, you know, it's a system. The body run, is a system, mm -hmm. circulatory system. You know, everything's a system, dude. And all you have to do is keep them functioning. One keeps the other one functioning, right? Yep. As long as you keep all those systems functioning, the body's going to stay alive. And so that was simple for me. The, yes. the medic job was was easy for me, man. It was. 
it was just running. Running was tough being 260 pounds <laughs> in the army. With the with the med pack. Yeah. Well, yeah, not including kit, man. I was just talking about PT tests. Yeah. Oh, Combat's sh- combat was easy. Fucking PT test, man. Dreadful. <laughs> so so I really want to get into like how did you build those relationships <clears throat> with your with your men, with the infantrymen that you were with? Oh man. That was easy. <laughs> what, what, oh, sorry. What, no, what so a lot of people when they go through um leadership training they're they're always told that you have to build this relationship with their men they're always told there's a one plus two equals three system in place that you can be successful with (coughs) throughout your experience what was the best structure that you saw that would lead to a success with men to overcome any type of difficult situation um for me i used I, I just worked on my my assets, right, man. Uh, me being a medic, I I didn't get chosen for for fire guard so much, right? Mm. So if I didn't get chosen for fire guard, I knew I was getting a couple extra hours of sleep than Joe Blow right here, right? But I'm gonna get up. I'm gonna make sure that he's got a Gatorade for his guard shift. I'm gonna go check on him, see if he needs somebody to talk to. Hey, do you need a piss break? Something like that. And that was a big game changer. I don't know. Who came? I think I think my boy Jackson and Payne came across that one. He's like, you gonna have a lot of downtime. You're gonna, hmm, I'm trying to think of where that came from. Sergeant First Class Jackson or Staff Sergeant Payne, man, they were my two biggest drill sergeant. You know, cameras that 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 kept me on track, man. Because without them, that was my AIT. We showed up 500. You know, what's AIT? AIT is uh, Advanced Individual Training. I think. Goodness, I don't know. Did I get that one right? I believe so. Oh, that, was, <laughs> that was a difficult question, Zach. Oh, man. Uh, yeah, we showed up to San Antonio. So first go to Sand Hill in Fort Benning, Georgia, where I see no females for like four and a half, five months. And then they send me to San Antonio with 500 people on a seat on a on, on a company. Yep. Half of them females. You're just like, oh, man, crazy. I'm surprised. You smell it. Dude. So. Payne Jackson, they definitely kept me on track. Jackson was like our 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 attack that was uh in charge of our platoon, making sure we made it to class and everything. Yeah. But man, they definitely hammered that in on our on our side time. Like, dude, you got a lot of downtime here. Guess what? Your guys in OSIT didn't have that downtime. You saw that while you were there. Mm. Like, yeah, it's true. Guess what? You're gonna have a you're gonna be very catered to if you get to the right unit. But that's because they're gonna need you to do shit in a crappy situation, right? So yeah, you get you get that downtime, but guess what? When it's time to turn that medic time, you got to go treat somebody. It's your turn, right? Mm-hmm. That's where that's where you are supposed to save up that energy for, right? But it was too easy, man, to build that relationship with my infantrymen, man. And the one big thing that I had going, I was 250 pounds. You know, I was an offensive lineman, so I came in, and yeah, they could all run really good, but I could grapple, right? Yeah. Throwing dudes around, you know, platoon sergeants like, you gonna let the medic throw you around? Too easy, dude. Blam! <laughs> did you compete in any type of grappling while you were? Yeah, yeah, I serving? did uh, army combatives uh, when I could. I, I was able to do one tournament in Fort Hood, and I snuck into that one. I made it through the first day, and then our company commander was like, "You're not supposed to be here." <laughs> like, I was medics are mission essential. You can't go getting your face pushed in. I was winning two black eyes the first day. Man. I couldn't see. I couldn't see the second day. <laughs> so, and then I got to. Uh, I got to compete in uh, Germany. I got to compete in Germany, and our uh, level four constructor. I was on my way out, and I was just arm barring everybody in Hohenfels, Vilsack, Stuttgart. And uh, I remember our battalion commanders, I just ran him through the ringer for like five minutes. And he's just like, how do we beat Doc? And I remember I, the Sergeant First Class was just like in his sleep with a bat. And I was just like, <laughs> I heard it out of the back of my ear. So I was like, he didn't hear me here, but I was like, oh, yeah, count it. Make sure y'all know Doc's bad around here. But that's, uh, you know, being there for them mm-hmm. and not, not, not ever – showing weakness man yeah you know in a shitty situation when people are freaking out you need to hold that composure you see the medic freaking out over something simple it's like yeah. a finger cut off or something you go oh this medic might not be ours yeah. you know absolutely and i i think being able to be you know cognizant in a situation where people aren't thinking properly oh yeah i mean that's the uh the biggest thing is when you're under any type of pain pain kind of takes priority over any type of other rational feeling that you have yeah and you have to be able to mitigate that um 
and it, uh, that takes training. A lot of people aren't trained to do that. It does. And I, man, luckily I have this like jokingly outlook because half of the time when I was actually treating people, my head's so jacked up. I, I'd be, I'd be humming, whistling. I, I, I was humming most of the time, but like I'm making dumb jokes, talking to them, trying to ease them. Yeah. I was just making jokes on the spot, man. But like talking mm -hmm. to my patient, keeping them active, keeping them present and keep, keeping a couple of them laughing, you know? Yeah. But it's just my sixth sense of humor. And that, that got me through a lot of it. But man, what really, I used to disconnect the world. I used to just hum. Mm -hmm. And so I could just keep that, that sound in my head and I can work on this body. Everybody I treated wasn't a friend. It wasn't mm -hmm. a soldier. It was a, it was a, a training dummy. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. It does. At the time I was like, I'm working on this training dummy. I'm doing this. I'm keeping this system operating. Remember I was talking about yeah. systems. That's all I'm doing. And man, I know some people, some people w wish, uh, I would have had a little bit more bedside manner, you know, less yeah. jokes, you know, but that's, but you're there, you're there to accomplish something. You're there to keep this system functioning. Something I had to do to stay, keep everyone alive. Yeah. And, and it, your 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 sanity is a priority in that in that moment at that moment yeah in that moment and and that's what that's why here here we are se seven years afterwards and i'm still working on that now you know i'm yeah. going back and processing all that and that's what whew, and using the what, motions now thank goodness what what what's that like do you feel that when you desensitize <laughs> yourself for such a long period of time that is hard to recover that sensory or is that something that you really feel just is always going to be disconnected from who you are no, it's you, you can, you can figure out how to bring those back. You, you need to, you need to figure out how to use these emotions. Um, mine, I don't control them a hundred percent. I'm still learning seven years after the army. I'm still learning how to use these emotions. Even just thinking about the process of learning. It's difficult. It sucks. But for you to move on from the military, the Marine Corps, the army, the air force, you have to learn how to use emotions, especially to the, talk to the civilian population. We talked about me being a father for me to learn how to raise this little animal. Mm -hmm. I need to learn how to use these emotions. So this guy doesn't turn into a whack job, right? N emotionalist psychopath that starts eating crayons and then <laughs> signs are on contract. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> it sounds like a good idea. Dude, he's going to be a battering ram. But right now I'm trying to teach him how to use these emotions so that he understands the world, right? He mm. can process it. Me, I just, I, I was raised, once I got, a, a, these coaches got a hold of me, I just became a missile, yeah. you know? Both of my parents were working their butts off trying to keep us alive. And, uh, you know, keep a roof over our heads, food in our mouth. Yeah. You know, l luckily I, I didn't come from too crazy of a, of, of a, of a background mm -hmm. I dealt with a bit of abuse growing up through from my mother, which I have a very broken relationship from. But, uh, you know, that was one thing that I looked into when I became that coach's missile. I was like, Oh, this is easy, man. He's just telling me what to do, where to be and how to do it too easy. And then, you know, I transferred that into the military and that's why the military was so easy for me on the duty state on duty time. I could turn that on, Yeah. but it was also easy for me to turn it off. That's why I spent 10 years in the military, you know, walked in PFC, I made my yep. E5 twice, got out of corporal, you know, but still retired, baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, ideally when you, what, what do you think that you take, you've taken from your childhood that you want to apply to your son? Hmm. Being present, um, definitely being present. I have that opportunity that my parents didn't have. They had to work themselves to death, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, and I, I believe they still are. My mother, I believe, is still um, having to work and, and do her, own, her thing. I don't really keep in contact with her. My father, he's 65, just re retired off of this second job, and he's trying to go get another job. You know, he's, he's, he, he kind of needs to, and, you know, nowadays. But uh, – I think just being present, yeah. you know, I don't, after I went through everything in college and I saw that these coaches, you know, yeah, they're great role models and to get through a lot of adversity and, and, and push yourself. Mm -hmm. But when half of them can't even do their taxes, yeah, man, let's, 
pump, pump the brakes. Don't, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Yep. Don't drink all the Kool-Aid, you know, take a sip, see if it works. Take some good out of it. Absolutely. And that's, and that's, you know, what I've been trying to do from the military, taking the good parts, keeping them inside yep. using those, the planning, the longevity of planning, the safety, the ability to, uh, well, that's how you build have leadership. structure, that's right? How you build your leadership. Right. Yes. But I'm also, you know, trying to rip out that other side. That's the emotionless machine that the army is, right? Yeah. That do it now because I said so, right? But now I'm trying to be like, was it objective, right? Objective. Trying to like, hey, man, what do you want to do today? What are we going to do instead of just like, here's, here's the plan. Here's what we're doing. I, I think that it's so beneficial to have something that you really want to set apart from. You need that baseline of, okay, this is not where we were, we're gonna go. We need to go in this opposite direction. Cause some people may just be walking in paths that they just have no idea. So they may be acting in, in aggression. They may be thinking that yelling is gonna solve the situation. They may think that a lot of um, bringing up a lot of past trauma into the a new type of relationship even though this person may not have all of the same qualities that were uh abusive to you before but they may have some of those qualities that were abusive to you you know th those things can still be objectified like you said and really see that okay well this is something that i recognize in in my past that i don't want to bring on to my new my new life oh for sure man for sure. And if it's one thing my buddy Pablo, has, you know, just dropped the eye of pearl on me about a year and change ago was yeah. just like, you know, every four to five years, you know, there's the ability to change. There's, yeah. there's, there's, there's this weird momentum in life. And I started looking back and it's true, man. You know, you know, we moved to the States in three to four years, you know, I had the opportunity for college. College was done. I had the opportunity to move into the army, you know, multiple duty stations every three to four years and get into different change of jobs. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, same thing after the army, you know, getting out, I went back to school, tried to become a nurse that took about three and a half years where I figured out how to be like a father. And then, then I figured out, I don't want to be a nurse. <laughs> but how did you still carry over that protective quality that you have? Well, you can keep that. I'm, I'm a, did, did you work in, you know, jobs that were protective or did you do anything? Bouncing. Else? Yeah, I did some bouncing, but that was, that was about it, man. I really, I, I got, I got into jujitsu to keep myself sharp. Yeah. And, and that's what I've really been doing. You know, after I got out of the army and I found out this world isn't about, it's not a team game. A lot yeah. of the time and you're on your own. I didn't, I didn't really get into anything like, like that. Um, I just, instead of like protecting the masses and protecting the team anymore, mm -hmm. I'd rather protect my home. And so the things I've been doing is, is, is you know, I, I always knew how to hunt. I, I know how to put food on the table. I'm just tightening up those little things about me in the yeah. past five, the past, the last six, seven years, you know, I've been through multiple changes, you know, going through nursing, going and diving. So this three to four years right now is what I'm trying to work on myself, being a parent, being a lover to my, to my beautiful woman, uh, you know, being present, using these emotions in our family and building that. And, uh, you know, keeping myself sharp. And one reason why I got into jujitsu is, yeah, I can't run. I can't ruck march anymore. Mm -hmm. I can't do stress shoots. No, but I can learn jujitsu. I can stay sharp. If somebody's in my wheelhouse, I can stay sharp with my nine mil. You know, it's too easy stuff that I've just been working on myself and just waiting for an opportunity for something else to happen, man. I think all those are both arts where you can, hum, <laughs> you can hum and you can get in that trance very much so <laughs> very much so and i enjoy the heck out of that one and yeah you're not you're not you know putting bodies together no separating them, no you know twisting rotating it's pretty fun it, it's it's you you can break the bones but only if they want to be broken <laughs> that doesn't want to tap. yeah um so i wanted to actually get into your diving um that's really something that i was interested in when you and i've been talking you, you you're you, there's so many different diving, such a broad category. It is, uh, and and you have a lot of diverse experience in diving. What what could you tell us about your diving experience? Yeah, man. Uh, what what drew me to diving? Uh, honestly, is I was getting out of nursing. I was just like, I got enough 
PTSD and trauma in my own treatments that I'm not going to do this in the civilian world. I don't want to deal with people and their worst because my bedside manner is crap. Mm. I was a paramedic in the army and the best part about me, I was out in the field playing army yeah. and somebody needed a medic. I had the knowledge to keep everybody going. Right. Um, but all, all my, uh, issues that I've had, um, some of the reasons I got retired, I got uh, compressions in my C1 and 2, and I got compressions in my lumbar, L1, 2, and 3. Uh, been blown up probably uh, 11 times, not including door charges and, yep. you know, range demo and stuff like that, the fun stuff, right? And getting to the points. Right. No. Uh, so one of my buddies uh, at the time, Tony Brown, I was living with a, a cop down in uh, uh, Lee County. And he was like, dude, check this out, underwater welding. And I was like, man, that's... Yeah, Pretty, pretty simple stuff. You're not welding all the time, but I like tying knots. And they were doing rigging and pulling stuff out of the water and doing salvage diving. And then I found out like, oh my God, you know, I was bouncing. I was yeah. having to sit down every two hours because my back's so jacked up. Well, let's get underwater. Take this pressure off my back. Let's see if we can do this. First time in the water, I found out that I could be under there for like four hours, five hours, just doing work. No problem. It was, it was awesome. Um, but I found a school up in, uh, Jacksonville called commercial dive Academy. Wow. That was, that was an experience. It was five months and they had like, they tried to do this military regiment. They have like a bunch of retired national guard diver dudes making you do PT and like, dude, just let me go to the gym. I got way better work at it. I don't need to be here at five 30 in the morning to tell you to let me walk, you know? Um, uh, but I got into it because I, I just wanted to get a, change it up, man. It was yeah. about that four to five year mark. And I had just left, you know, the nursing school and college and all that. And I was like, let's go try this trade school out yep. and get back into construction. Something that I, I, I always enjoyed some that manual labor. It's something that's simple. You can turn the brain off and just yep. work and uh, had a blast. I started working for, uh, I went to, to the school we learned how to weld we learned how to do pipe fittings and all sorts of different crazy hard hat working tying knots was my favorite what, thing what kind of suit were you in oh no the suits are just heck i was in 511 pants and a, and a long sleeve you know dive shirt yeah. uh you know a, a H H U K shirt huck shirt or you know whatever um but uh, uh i wasn't doing like toxic or waste diving That's what I was asking. that you need like a galvanized rubber suit yeah and that one latches into the head and they got gloves and yeah. boots set up no, no remember i got retired from the military i don't have to go do that crap <laughs> you know i was like uh oh yeah there's habitat diving and the keys yeah, yeah we'll i take that one yeah i'll just we'll go down yeah. and it's nice when you sign your own destination and I mean. and that is one thing that the army made me very dangerous the military made me dangerous when they gave me my that that uh dd214 the retirement papers it gave me a check on the first each month yep and and a little bit of freedom did they pay for your school they did pay for my school they they paid for my school um yeah i used my gi bill wow so yeah it's just the gift that keeps on it, it, it 100 yeah uh, you know and, and another thing that i i was actually hoping to give that gi bill to my kid later on but i ended up using it anyways because wound up needing it <laughs> i i really want to also get into because based off of our relationship i've all, always really seen you with your dog and uh based off of a lot of the things that you've gone through in your life you really attached to your your when i met you you had kong um, con 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 change um, just con could, could you just kind of tell me why it was so oh, important man. for you to have a service animal? Yeah, you and, and I what met. what you were uh, going through? Oh, sorry, sorry. I didn't mean to you're cut good, you off. You're though. good. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, you and I definitely met in an interesting time. I had just gotten out about two and a half years prior. Um, I was living on my own. Uh, not, excuse me, I wasn't even living on my own. I was living at my dad's house, but uh, he was working all day and I was bouncing at night. So I was in a house all by myself. Um, just going to school. And I wound up having panic attacks. Dude, it was the craziest thing I'd ever heard of. Like, I ended up passing out on the tile floor and split my head open, went into the doctor. And I'm like, I don't know what's happening. I'm just passing out on, on the couch. I'm doing my homework, just passing out. I'm not even drinking at this point. I'll tell you when I'm drinking. I'm usually yeah. out at the bar. And uh, so the guy's like, dude, you're having panic attacks. I was like, what? Yeah, you're having panic attacks. Like. Nah, I don't know what you're talking about. What's a panic attack? 
And he told me, and I'm like, yep, that's a panic attack. He's just like, yeah, you're having them. It's like, no way, dude. I've been a medic for 10 years, you know, dealing with the amputations, throwing tourniquets on, on femoral arteries, plugging gunshot wounds, you know, dealing with eviscerations. That's dude's guts open and stuff. <laughs> poking people dead people in the chest just to like show that you know hey we're working on the bad guys yep nah they were just dead they didn't even know it but i like now i have anxiety i'm sitting in cape uh fort myers florida looking at a pool passing out yeah yeah you're having a bag attack no shit he's like yeah well yeah i used to live in a barracks with 90 people for basic training i got out of basic training i went up to you know fort wayne right did everything I could to not live in the barracks. There's five guys getting a house. All right, let's do it. Mm. Two, two, three hundred bucks a month. Everybody's making sixteen hundred bucks on BAH. Pfft. Did yeah. it? Did it in Texas too. Got got back from our our Missoula deployment. Hey man, who's getting a house? Five dudes in one house. And I didn't see this. I didn't see this pattern. Yeah, I thought I was a loner. I had my motorcycle. I was doing whatever I wanted on the weekends. But I still had that camaraderie. I had that team element in my house. Now that was all just taken away. I, I came back stateside. I'm here in my house passing out. And dude's like, have you ever thought of a service animal? Dude, game changer. Game changer. Wound up, uh, yeah, wound up getting con. Uh, he's uh, the third borable that I've ever, ever had. Uh, and he was just a blessing in complete disguise because I got him as this little four month old puppy. And I'm trying to train this thing. And it was a reinforcement that I'm doing the same thing with my child. I got a three-year-old son that doesn't speak English real good like, right? Mm. <laughs> the dog doesn't either. So it was able, I was able to keep that parenting going, right? Seeing what I could instill in the dog through training. We ended up becoming, a, uh, we ended up getting him a service animal. We went through um, uh, uh, Warrior Angels uh, out of uh, Ocala. And... Um, we did a training every Monday for a year and a half. And he wound up getting first time goes on all his certs, man. We got him squared away. He was able to go on flights with me. He was able to go up to Jacksonville. Didn't have to, you know, get charged astronomical rent, you know. And, and it was cool because I could have him with me. I had that team element back with me again, right? It was it was awesome. Yeah. And <sighs> it, I, it's so special for, you know, animals to get – someone that they can attach with yeah and um if you if you're out there with dealing with issues i think you should really look into getting a service animal because it gives you that chance to have love again oh man it's not even the love it's just the, com camaraderie. the camaraderie that team element that functioning team element you can see and stay here giving commands and you're staying here with yourself right you're not just zoning off thinking of, I don't know, mm -hmm. politics or what's coming down the road, right? You're looking at the dog. You're making sure he's good. He's checking on you to make sure you're good. You know, it's a little tough for me. I had to put yeah. Con down last April. I'm sorry, man. But. How I, long did you have him? Four years. Yeah. Um, but I can't knock him, man. God, that dude gave me another lesson, dude. You yeah. know. Uh, and a lot of this training that we went into, you know, you got to realize that this dog is you. He is a carbon copy of what I was. And uh, we had to put him down because somebody came up on us on a hoverboard and he did what he does, man. He, he turned, he got in between me and my son and the hoverboard and he bit the person on the hoverboard. Yeah. But, you know, it also taught me this last lesson that my buddy Magnus really pushed. My buddy Magnus, uh, he's the uh, founder of Mission 22. Uh, he's the EOD uh, special forces guy that just, he started a 5013, uh, excuse me, started a non -ch nonprofit charity up there uh, helping veterans. And he talked to me and he was like, hey dude, what positives can you take out of this? <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> and I was like, this dog is who I am. I cannot. We had just moved to Tampa from Jacksonville. And we had just moved into a 
a community. I wasn't living in an apartment downtown Jacksonville, right? I'm living in a community with 60 houses, a gated community with kids. Yeah. And I had to make that decision, right? To put the dog down. But I also need to know that I can't let myself do that yeah. anymore. I don't have that opportunity. I have safeties in place now that I don't have to be that hothead anymore. I need to use these emotions and not have knee jerk reactions, right? Yeah. Cause if I do that, I get out of the car, somebody cuts me off, I fucking pull a gun out, I'm going to jail for 10 years, right? Yeah. Right? So if it's one thing that I can take from Khan going down is, is that he gave me that last, <sighs> that last lesson of don't become me, right? Mm -hmm. This is who I created. This is everything the army showed me how to create. Yep. And I created it with no motion, right? He did a job, yep. right? And I can't blame him for it because I was doing the same stuff. But the lesson that I can take is don't turn, don't turn into that, right? Yeah. Don't be that. Okay, how do I not be that? Add emotion, add clarity, add thinking, positivity. Don't be a hothead, right? And now being present for my son and showing those values, hopefully I can in, and show him a yeah. path, right? I don't want to force him down a road. My parents didn't do that to me. Yeah. They showed me the right thing, right? Sometimes by not even knowing it. Yeah. But that's the one last that I could take from him, man. That service animal changed my life. It got me through so many things and having a teammate when I was, you know, in an apartment in Jacksonville by myself, you know, just like didn't allow me to just sit there and pound booze and booze and booze, right? I, I needed to be here. I needed to be present for this guy. So that was service animals were an amazing thing. And man, they tell you, teach you a whole bunch of lessons. <laughs> now you've seen we got a house full of three dogs still. Exactly. But <laughs> and 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 did you do anything specific uh, or anything different outside of your realm of treatment or to try and help you deal with this? Did you do like more meditation or did oh. you do more? Um, <clears throat> I actually am taking cues from, uh, my beautiful wife, Angela. Uh, she has shown me another level of love that I didn't know existed. Right. Uh, she shows me how to use my passion, right. Mm -hmm. To care. Yeah. Passionate person. I'm very intense. Right. But she showed me this element of love that I I've never even, I've never seen in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. and watching her interact with these dogs it's just been such a blessing you know uh i don't need to be the super rigid rigorous soldier that i was mm -hmm. she shows me that these guys are dogs mm -hmm. my eight month old borable is a hundred and fifty five pound dope sometimes yep. he pisses me off because he just gets in my way and i gotta remember he's an eight month old toddler right mm -hmm. this dude's a child and man when she's around she's just like oh Oh, man, it just shows me a whole nother element of these animals and what I wasn't able to give Khan yeah. to be a part of this new world that I'm I'm in, right? So just love, man. She showed me how to love. Uh, Connor, my son, yeah. he showed me how to love. His unconditional love is just off the charts. Did you read any books that were really trying to help you kind of get your mind right? during those situations dang it i just told i told you i got that stinging book um the, the the big one was the war on the soul i didn't read any self-help books how to love uh i'm letting these emotions come as i will as they will excuse me mm -hmm. um the war on the soul book really taught me how to that just because i have ptsd i'm not broken i'm not shattered just my ptsd i'm I f used to feel like I was detached from myself, but then I just found out that like, I got a lot of body trauma from this stuff, right? A lot of people don't tell you that PTSD is not just in the head. You have legit trauma. So you, everybody can get it. You're in a car accident. Mm -hmm. You get blindsided. And next time you go into your left lane, you're gonna, you're gonna think a little bit, right? That's PTSD. But that's that body trauma. And having those blasts go off around you and having all the people just amped up and all the different screams and yellings in your head takes over your body, right? It's just overwhelming. And that's, back then it didn't have a problem. 
I was able to cut that out. I didn't have emotion back then. I had a purpose. I had a mission. I had an objective. I had to keep everyone alive. Didn't have the opportunity to use those emotions. Now I'm just feeding that same passion with those emotions, putting this animal under, under check with the emotions, but involving emotions so that I can still deal with the civilian world. I can still deal with my son. I can still deal with my, my, my wife. Uh, that I can deal with the person at the grocery store without snapping, right? How many times have you been at the at the Publix deli and they're just not able to slice it fast enough or just put the freaking tomato on because you're not breathing, you got all this energy and you got to go. But man, you put that emotion inside of you and you think that these are human beings too. <sighs> have a little compassion, right? What, what's it like when you don't catch it? And you let yourself go. Man, it is an everyday battle. It's it's sad. Ugh, it's sad. Uh, because you feel like a hothead, right? You're wired. I'm wired for violence. And I do it well. And uh, But I also have to know that I'm not in a great environment for violence, right? I'm in a community of Tampa, Hillsborough County, right? Yeah. I can't be like Khan. Right. I have to control this when all this cortisol is running and people are being jerks to you and they're cutting you off. You're just like, Ooh, breathe, man. Use that emotion. Use, use that compassion. Try and think that these people aren't doing this on purpose. There are a hundred there. There's what? 7 billion people on the world that are just running around like ants trying to get somewhere where you're trying to get right. Got to breathe, brother. You got to be in the now. You can't think that, oh, I'm going to be five minutes late now. No, nah, man. <sighs> breathe. We'll get there. We'll get it done with. And, and man, use that compassion. These people that you're snapping on, you get that cortisol leveling. I just want my fucking burger now. Why is that so hard? You make 30 of them right now. Give me a burger. You know, like you need to breathe, man. You, you don't know what that person's going through. You don't know the... 47 orders that just came in their window, right? Being in that moment is horrible because you make snap decisions and you look like a turd. You look like a complete jerk. Even though you're like, I was efficient, I got it done, I got out of there, right? Mm. Yeah. But the 18-year-old person at the counter was bug-eyed like this, mm -hmm. looking me, at me walking out with my seven-year-old, wondering if the seven-year-old's going to be okay. Seven-year-old's going to be fine. I'm good, right? She doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. And in the hindsight, using these emotions really wake you up, man. They make you want to be a better person. They do, make me want to be a better person. Do Do you carry those interactions with you? Does no. it? Do you Do you feel shame for that? No, no, no. no. Good. I don't feel shame. Good. No, I'm. I am who I am. Right. A little yeah. Popeye action. I am who I no. am. Yeah. But uh, that's always going to be me. It's an everyday struggle. I'm not ashamed of it because I know that I've saved lives being who I am. I know that when I'm on and when I'm in that mode, if it's needed, I'm so good, <laughs> you know, and I feel good, but it's not necessary on big Ben Seven Eleven, you know, yeah. with the 17 year old girl that isn't finished homework and she just wants $7 for whatever you're trying to buy. Right. But her, ringer's not working or she took too long with the idiot that was trying to get lotto tickets. Right. And that's mm -hmm. why you're upset. Yeah. Use that emotion, use that compassion, use that love for other beings. Mm. And I, and, and that's another thing that I use watching Angela with the dogs, you know, those aren't even humans. They're not hers, right? They're not, they didn't come from her. Those are just different animals right yeah and she still can just put that love and compassion into it why can't i do that for another human and i and i and i try every day man every time i come back i have a good interaction i'm like hey babe you gotta check this out i did this man she's like good job man <laughs> i'm like oh, yeah it's that have... reinforcement yeah dude she knows how she knows that reinforcement man she knows how to the the what, what i see what i'm just hearing it, it's it's just so incredible um you know, it, being able to realize that you have a gift, you have a, a specialty, and 
it's something that a lot of us have a problem with because sometimes our specialties, we might not have that like person that reinforces us or gives us that, you know, confidence. We go through our dark holes until we find that person that helps us. Um, if you don't have that external, you know, representation of yourself, what what would you suggest somebody to do to find that? I had to take a break. I, I, I had to take a knee. One of my biggest things through all my interactions with, uh, you know, Mission 22 and everything I've ever came with any benefit was take a knee, man. Take a knee and breathe. <laughs> when I got hurt and I had to, you know, get all my surgeries and I was getting pushed out of the army, I was pushed out of the army, I was getting forced retired from the army. I got back here and I was wigging out. You know, like, oh, what do I do? Do I go get a job? Do I, what is going on? Right. Uh, I had to take a knee, man. I had to take a break. I sat down, get a plan in order, right? Breathe. Take a break. If if everything's moving too fast and you can't catch on to things, everything's whizzing by you and you don't have a clear head, are you making decisions with a clear head? If not, take a knee. Take a break. If it 12 hours, 24 hours, give yourself a day. Take a break. Stop, you know, if, 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 it's, if it's drinking, take a break from drinking. 24 hours, clear your head. Make a plan. Breathe. Even if it's not planning that you need, take a break and look back at the interactions that you've had over the day. Mm -hmm. are, your, are your interactions positive or negative? How do you, and if they're negative, flow charts, man, right? I told you that medic <laughs> yeah. thing, right? It's yeah. super easy. Is this yes or no? Yes, go this way. No, go this way, right? So positive, negative. How was your day? Did you have a positive day? Did you have a negative day? I had a negative day. How do we make that positive? Mm -hmm. But take that, take that break, take that knee and, and really think, how does this work? How do I prevent this from happening again? And man, if, if you're in that spiral going downhill, I was, you know, bouncing, being a single father and drinking, eight days a week no. going, going down a spiral, you know, you know, getting into altercations. I didn't need to be getting into, you know, uh, but I, I had to separate myself. I, I had to detach myself from just that area. I mm -hmm. left Lee County and I went up to Jacksonville, took a break yeah. even for that year. That even me going to dive school, that was, like, oh, I'll get the army to pay for it, whatever. I'll take a break. Yeah. That's what it was, man. It cleared my head. <sighs> can't can't make a life down there man that little if you're in that spiral you're that constant grind and you're not making any progress take a knee mm -hmm. take a knee breathe look around you look for those moves there's moves everywhere there's advantages that we have as as veterans we have a different mindset than a lot of civilians they can't just change on a dime we've all been able to uplift ourselves from our hometowns and go somewhere and come back whether whether you came back to your hometown or not right so take that knee breathe look look at these decisions that that's happening look at look at the positive routes make those positive decisions dig yourself out man and the, and the only way you're going to sustain being out is if you can do it yourself don't look for somebody for handouts don't be looking for quick books how to get out of it you got to do the hard work and it it's tough a lot of this emotional crap is tough mm -hmm. and and coming from somebody who full has full understanding of how to how the body works it's very you know you've been very uh adamant about saying breathe oxygen is the number one thing that helps our brains function and you can't heal the brain without proper nutrients and oxygen is the number one nutrient for uh, for us. So if you can breathe, you're just giving yourself a, a fighting chance <laughs> for sure. You know, if, if you don't breathe and you just keep, you know, supplying alcohol, which takes away the oxygen to the brain, you're, you're, you're giving yourself, you know, uh, 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 uh you're not giving yourself a, a positive foundation to build any type of, um, new, uh, overcoming trauma and, <sighs> I've just been dealing, I dealt with a lot of those things too. So it's just kind of, you know, breathing is a, something I just lose all the time. And I never realize how big of a difference it makes when I finally do breathe. What were some routes that you took out? Well, for that? me, I, I mean, you were going down those spirals. What did you do? I self-medicated. Self-medication is a huge thing that I did. I did a lot <laughs> of, um, I didn't, I wanted to verse myself in alternative therapies outside of just prescriptions because for me, it was just too much. And, 
you know, meeting people that were dealing with the same things that I were going that I was going through, it made it really like more relatable and realized like, okay, well, if if I continue down this path, this is how you know it can it can get this bad, you know. And you know, once I realized that there's other things out there like breathing techniques, um, taking you know cold baths, you know, just being able to to find a peace in nature. You know, there's a really things, simple things that we can do that are in our control that can make a big difference. You still doing those cold plunges? I'm down oh. all day, every day. I did so many in college. Like everybody, it's so crazy because you hear like everybody doing it. Everybody in jujitsu. Oh yeah. Joe Rogan's talking about cold plunges. I was like, dude, I it's took an school. ice bath from O two to like yeah. 06 when school. I joined the army. <laughs> Every football <laughs> practice, our coach, the offensive lineman, you're sitting in their waist deep minimum. And me being a psychopath, I was like, I can go to my neck. And so like, I had like the one reputation. I got to go all the way to my neck yeah. for four and a half years. I did ice bath, ice bath. Everybody's wow. like, oh, have you ever done a cold plunge? It's like, get away from me. Yeah. I live, I, I live in Florida. Get away from me. <laughs> like, that was that was the luxury after practice, though, was to get into the ice bath because dude. it was so hot. No, uh, no. The, if, the after you get out, that was the best part. It sucked. When oh, I, I love getting when in. you got it. No, you're a psycho. I love getting psycho. in. I, love getting I was. In. I would get in and like nobody touched me. Nobody <laughs> touched me. Like somebody would touch you and it's like ah ah. Nobody touched me. And then so like you get out and then everything's just Tingling. all tingle, yeah. pins and needles, and you can feel your muscles just like. <sighs> but you get into the mental center when you're in there. You have to overcome this constant pain. And you're just like, okay, well, you once you get to that that mentality of acceptance, yeah, then your life just gets so much more like manageable. I had to get to three minutes. If I got to three minutes, it was good. <laughs> I was like, ah, the, my brain will turn. So, off. are you a, a spiritual guy? Do you really get into that stuff? Do you believe in energies? I don't know what what is the the meaning of the this mala, this the mala. mala. So, like, right, it's a Buddhist prayer beads. I don't use it for praying specifically. I do meditation, but I do. Uh, like binomial tones. It has nothing. It's not really Buddhist or anything, but I use this as a fidget spinner. I, uh, I wore my buddy's uh, memorial tin for s fucking 10 years. Mm -hmm. I'm not really ready to talk about him yet, but uh, the guy that passed away in 09, right? One guy that, that we've actually lost that I've lost um, uh, that we lost, but I wore his memorial tin for, 10 years and that was part of that thing with Khan, right? Yeah. Khan turning and biting, right? That was who I was. I don't need that reminder of who I was or that ability that I have. That's with me every day. Why do I have to carry him around memorials? Right? I got him in my house, right? Yeah. It's on my shelf, but I don't need it on me. Right? This if I'm having a bad day and I'm talking to that 17 year old chick in 7-Eleven or I'm waiting behind some idiot trying to get lotto tickets, I sit here and I just grab this it's a little fidget spinner, man. Mm. No, I'm not. I'm not spiritual. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about it. You know, the last yeah. time I'm not really religious, I'm not really spiritual. I just take all that. I have done a lot of studying through edicts of non. I've done tons of Buddhism uh, uh, reading. Uh, I grew up Roman Catholic. I read uh, Christian uh, um, Bibles. Um, I've also read the Quran, uh, an English version that uh, our, our Terp got uh, for my uh, um, Solder City deployment. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, like I said, I read through all those books and they all say, don't be a dick. But again, what I can do is take pieces that work for me, right? Mm -hmm. The meditation from Buddhism, I loved it. The centering oneself and just being here in the now has just whew, taken a breath, taken a knee, taking a break, being here. Don't worry about the future. Don't worry about the past. Be right here. This is where, this is where the past is made. Mm -hmm. The future isn't yet, right? Um, and, and, and those are all things I enjoy. Those are all things that, that I've taken that work for me. Uh, so it's not really a religious thing. It's not really a spiritual thing, but it is a me honing myself and being here in the now, right? It's putting me in place. It's letting me 
focus these emotions instead of just them running through me like you just see and just me just getting teary-eyed, right? That'll freak a 17-year-old out, right? Yeah. <laughs> Again, all those quarters, all you all you can't control those emotions. The shaking's really what gets them. Shaking gets them pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> it makes them feel so good when you leave though. but uh but this is one thing that hones me it allows me to focus here and now and allows me to go all right you're free you're, you're going you're freaking out no you're not freaking out breathe breathe <sighs> be here yeah. okay right oh yeah i'm right here cool and i can focus on the discussion at the deli or you know the wendy's or whatever i'm at yeah so that's it's so powerful you know being able to be present and that's the hardest thing to do is you always get caught up in your head and you're not being able to to realize what's happening in front of you and or or what what we're showing the world you know how many rooms have i walked in and controlled a room and not used words yep and uh, that was one thing that was pretty funny that angela saw you know she she was attracted to my stature my presence in certain areas and the commanding presence that a lot of us have because we've been through schools. We learn leadership techniques. We understand how to control rooms. And then you take 15 of us and put us on a team and we walk through a building, control the house. Right. Yeah. And so she started seeing this stuff too. And she was like, Hey, maybe next time breathe. And I was like, what? I was fine. I was just talking to everyone. Yeah. But you were kind of doing this. I don't see that, but now I have to recognize that. I have to use that honing skills of being here and breathe, right? So that I can have proper conversations instead of just talking to people and knife handing people and telling people stuff, right? That well, it's it's hard because that's how get, shit gets done. It is. It's sometimes, <laughs> man. But man, if you watch Angela work, she doesn't knife hand anyone, yeah. and stuff gets done, man. And that woman. That woman makes stuff move. That's the best part is, you know, we, we over time, we eventually find those counterparts that really are able to expose us to a life that we were never able to, you know, see. Yeah. You know, we never knew that there could be elegance into leadership. You know, we never knew that. It's it's rigidity. You know, A, a plus B equals C. And there. Maybe and, in the core. Well, maybe in the yeah. core. Maybe. But it, it's. Uh, we got some weird ways in the army, <laughs> we, man. They, <laughs> you guys cross streams Dude, a lot. there's a lot. Yeah, a a lot. lot. Yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, you guys only have, what, two posts? So, I mean, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when, uh, when you started getting into, you know, the healing aspect of things, it's. Did you start meeting people that were really kind of life changing or were there the more, you know introspective you got the the more healing you know was made <sighs> was healing made through your relationships or through your um through yourself both both because my relationship has nothing to do with the military angela i, I met angela three years ago you know five years after i got out you yeah. know that, that she has no she's she's pure she's so pure she's yeah. not unscathed she thinks everyone's a hero that's in the military you know i just keep yeah, yeah, keep that up. But uh, it's, it's sorry, I'm joking. But uh, it's a nice break that she has nothing to do with the military because it gives me guidance in the civilian world. I can see the civilian world in my house, right? Mm. I'm not dating or uh, you know married to another E6 or another E7 in my house that thinks, talks, eats the same. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, or at least has been taught that. Right, because we date. I dated a couple military people afterwards. It was, it was tough. Yeah. It not it wasn't tough. It was easy. But man, we had no communication with the outside world. Right, it's just mm -hmm. her and I. Yeah. Uh, so it's 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 been a, a little bit of both. You know, me working on myself due to my past traumas in the military is just me. Yeah. That's my intrins in, intrinsic 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 thinking that um that I do work on. With her and I, it's a whole different animal. That's my relationship with her, how to treat somebody in the civilian world. You know, our, our first couple of arguments, you know, was quite hectic because, you know, I'm thinking one way, she's thinking another way. We're both saying the same shit. Mm. Hey, lady, we're saying the same thing. <laughs> and, you know, I find that out afterwards and we breathe and we talk. And so now I learn how to communicate in the civilian world because I have a civilian in the house. So it's been such a blessing. Uh, but the in the military part that I've been doing was all internal through like mission 22 uh, doing the the um, a lot of talking with similar uh, 
combat veterans, right? Mm-hmm. I've gone through group therapies, man. You sit there and you talk to everybody and somebody has a bad day because they heard incoming fire and people have bad days, right? They saw a rocket come through and then there's other people that it, were standing next to a guy that was no longer there two seconds later, right? Mm. So it's hard to do the group thing and I understand that. I found a lot of benefit in finding other specialized combatant dudes like uh, bat guys, uh, SF guys, uh, you know, other combat medics that were on Lurs teams, infantry units, right? You know, me and somebody that worked at a TMC or a cache probably don't have the same traumas. So it's tough to try and, uh, uh, um, it's tough to try and, uh, Relate? Relate. Relate, right? Yeah. So if you can't relate with everybody in your room, how are you supposed to work on it, right? Yeah. So I found a lot of benefit was getting in the room with other, you know, combat veterans and we just hash it out and talk. Yeah. Hey man, what are you seeing? What are you doing? How do you how do you conquer this? Well, I do this. Okay, that might work for me. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna try that out. You know? <laughs> just yeah. little little that and that's what I've found benefits in. Uh finding similar uh dudes that are trying to be progressive uh you know i i went through a bunch of silky marches florida for warriors went through irrelevant warriors you know getting around other veterans and then you find out some are there for the party some are there to have a good time which is not bad it was yeah. a great party memories i loved it i got tons of memories <laughs> way too many memories actually but uh it just i but i had to put myself in there to find out it wasn't for me right yeah and that's something I did. And it's, it's, it's a process. It was a, a long, it's been a seven year process and I'm still doing it today. Yeah. You know, it's, it's continuous every day. And you, and, and you, if you, if you want to quit, man, you don't, you don't have a choice to quit. You no. don't have the choice to quit. There's no quitting because even if you want to quit, you're going to learn something new the next day. Something's going to come across your plate that you didn't know. Yeah. Uh, so, so there's no, there's no quitting involved. Right. And, and so there's all sorts of techniques that we can we can learn to progress and stay positive. And I and I, and I struggle with it every day. Wake up and trying to be positive, using that compassion, using that energy, using that emotion. Right. Well, I, I'm I really want to kind of wind things down, and I wanted to just ask what what do you think people can do to maintain that positive mentality? Well, you got to start with drinking water, changing your socks, yep. you know, taking a Motrin. Knee. Taking a knee, man. <laughs> Take a knee, drink water, bro. Take a knee and drink water. Yeah. Uh, that dude, that's the biggest thing for me to stay positive, man. Uh, mm-hmm. That's the biggest thing for me is because I can I can turn like that. Yeah. I'm my worst critic, and if I start having crappy days or bad interactions, I can spiral real quick. And once you put these things in place and to to learn how to use these emotions, you can understand what emotions are coming and why, right? You have to, you might have to, you know, figure out why, you know, some days I don't know that I'm having bad head days, right? I have images that flash in my head and I have migraines that come from like screaming of uh, people, people yelling that I've treated, right? Mm. I don't know it at first. It takes me 10 hours to figure it out. And then I get done with jujitsu and I go to Publix. I have a bad interaction. I'm like, why am I having a bad interaction? Why is the light so bright? Oh my God, I'm having a migraine. Yeah. So now I have to figure out how to combat that, right? Um, so it's, it's all about everything, everything in order, being able to take a break, right? Take that mm-hmm. knee and breathe and try and figure out what's going on. And that's something I try and do every day, man. Whether it's in the morning, getting up and trying to, you know, take that knee and be positive. If I wake up, my head's already going like we talked the last time. Oh, I got to do this, this. (sighs) Take a knee. Go sit on the couch, okay? Do not take a literal knee. (laughs) A lot lot of us have bad knees from being veterans and all. I got it. Don't take a knee. You might not be able to get up. So go sit on the couch, pet the dog, take three minutes and breathe, right? (laughs) It's literally the best thing you can do for your body. For me, for me, it is. And that's what I do. I go through the checklist. Okay. Is my back working? Cool. Is my ankle good? Cool. My head good? Cool. Yeah. What do we got to do today? That's rough. I, I, you're such a great man. You're, you're, you're a great father. You're a great, um, you served your country in a great way. And 
you know, you, there's there's so much that I just I envy, not envy, but I'm just I'm I'm really appreciative of you for, and um, thank you for coming on to to the podcast here and and talking more about you know who you are as a man and what makes you so special because of all these things that you've experienced, you can now help so many people with it, uh, especially you know with service animals and uh, um, so thank you so much, Raf. Thank you for get coming here. I, we really appreciate it. Thank you for having me, brother. And I, I, call me up whenever you got my number. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. We, we I got I, it. I love talking. So, so um, everybody, thank you for joining us. This was a, a incredible episode. So, always remember that when you're out there living out your core values, impossible dreams become impossible realities. Thank you, and we'll catch you next time. Over and out. Thanks for listening to Core Values. While we aim to represent all branches of the military, we can't do it without you, our listeners. Want to be on the show or know someone who should? Reach out to us on our Instagram at Core Values Official or on our website at corevalues.io. Thanks for listening. And remember, impossible dreams can become impossible realities.